Welcome back. My name is Matt and in this fourth CAD on training video on how to use Adobe Premiere Pro, I'm going to show you how to take care of your audio. When it comes to telling your story, sound is just as important, if not more important, than your visuals. As such, it requires just as much care and attention. On the one hand, you need to build your soundscape by bringing together all the various audio elements that will help tell your story. In our case, these elements already include spoken words and natural sound, but we're also going to add music. On the other hand, you need to deal with various technical issues to make sure everything sounds good. At a basic level, these technical issues are really simple. You need to make it flow, so that means getting rid of distracting noises and obvious jumps. You also have to work on the volume so that it's consistent and reaches the right levels. And you have to mix your various audio elements so that nothing is too loud or too quiet, and what needs to be heard is clear. At a more advanced technical level, you need to deal with things like tonal quality and dynamic range. We will touch on these things at the end of this video, but we won't be able to talk about them in depth. To help you do all this properly, it really is essential to wear a good pair of headphones. Once you've got a mix that sounds good, you may want to test it on various speakers as well. Before we get started, let's change our layout again so we can see all the audio tracks on our timeline. I want to begin by adding some music to the edit, just to show you how it's done. If I'm going to use music, I usually like to add it to my sequence in the early stages of editing, because it helps define the video's mood and pace the cuts, but adding it at the end when your edit's pretty much complete is a viable way of working too. Selecting a piece of music for your video can take a very long time, because it's important that it sets the right tone and fits the edit. I've selected a tune already, so let's go to the project window to find it. Here it is in the Other Elements bin. This is a track I've found on a website called ccmixter.org. It's released under a Creative Commons license, so I'm free to use it as long as it's for non-commercial purposes, and I credit the creator, which I'll do at the end of this training video. To add this piece of music to our sequence, I'm going to show you an alternative way of editing using the Source Monitor. If you double-click on the file to open it in the monitor, now let's zoom in to the beginning. It's got this long intro that I don't want, I only want to use it from this point here where the tune starts. Also the piece is too long and I don't need all of it. So what we're going to do is add in and out points to select a segment of the music to add to the sequence. To add an in point here where I want the music to start, it's best to be exact. So we need to listen to the section where the tune comes in to find the right spot. Position the playhead just before it and press the space bar to start. And there you go, if you stop it just before the tune comes in, now use the right and left arrow keys on your keyboard to move around and find exactly the right point. Then, to mark the in point, you press this button at the bottom of the monitor. If you hover over it, you can see it says Mark In. The keyboard shortcut is I. To mark out, it's this button next to it, or the O on your keyboard. It's not important where the out point is right now, because we can change the length on the timeline, so let's just put it here. Now we've got a small section of the piece of music selected. To drag it onto the timeline, hover over this waveform icon here. As you can see, the cursor turns to a hand icon. If you click and hold and drag, and let's drop it here on audio 3, starting just where the opening title starts. Premiere helps to snap it in place for you. If this were a video clip, you could drag it over to the timeline from any point here in the source monitor. But as this is only audio, you need to use the waveform icon. Now it's added to our sequence. Let's make it longer so that it lasts for the whole of our edit. Pull the end of the clip here. I'm quite familiar with this piece of music, and I know it's going to fit the mood of my sequence, but I don't know if it's going to work with the cuts yet, so let's play it back now to find out. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. Right, well that needs quite a bit of work to get it right. For one thing, the cuts aren't in time with the music, so I'm going to have to change the length of the clips. It's normal to have to spend quite a bit of time fiddling around with a piece of music to make it work well with your edit. You'll need to cut it up and shift bits around, and you'll also need to re-edit your sequences. So bear this in mind when you're deciding whether to use music or not. It can get very time consuming. We don't have the time to make this perfect now, 
so I'm just going to leave it as it is. Before we move on, I just want to explain something about these audio tracks. By default, they are stereo tracks. As you can see, there are two waveform lines, and when you press play, there are two bars jumping up and down here in the audio meter. If we take a look at audio one, you can see these little letters on the track, L and R, that stands for left and right, which are the two channels of audio held within this track. Most recording devices like cameras record two channels of audio. In this case, you'll notice that the waveforms are exactly the same. That's because both channels recorded the same thing using one mic. So this isn't true stereo, it's actually two identical mono recordings put together on a stereo track. If we got rid of one, it would sound exactly the same, just not as loud. The music we've added is true stereo. If I expand this track, you'll see that the two waveforms are slightly different. And when you listen to the music through headphones, you'll notice that it sounds slightly different in each ear, giving a sense of depth and space. In video, simplicity rules. Unless you're working at an advanced level, you won't be playing around with true stereo or surround sound, which is also possible in Premiere Pro. It is true that the standard practice is to export audio in stereo. Also, anything that is true stereo within your edit like this music will retain its properties. But despite this, what you need to aim for is something that sounds the same in both of your ears when you listen through headphones. As such, you need to watch out for audio with two channels where the channels were recorded at different levels or using different mics. For instance, when I'm filming an interview or something like that, I will often rely on just one mic, but set it to record at different levels on the two separate channels, so one will be slightly louder than the other. The quieter channel is a safety net in case the louder channel distorts, which might happen if an interviewee suddenly laughs or something. If you had a piece of audio like that in your edit, you'd notice it sounded different in each ear, so this is something you have to fix. To show you what to do, I'm going to bring a new clip into my project. So let's go over to the project window and right click to import. There's the clip on my desktop, two channels. This is just a clip from one of our kit videos. So let's put it into our footage bin and drag it onto the sequence. It doesn't matter where I put this because it's not going to be part of the edit. Now, as you can see, the two waveforms look different. The left channel on the top is bigger because it's louder. Let's play it back. And as we do, watch these two audio meters and you'll see that the one is consistently higher than the other. Hello, I'm Lizzie, and welcome to this, the third of CADON's series of kit videos. So what we want to do is select just one channel. The best way to do this is probably before the clip is brought into the sequence. But once it is in a sequence, as it is now, what you do is right click on the clip and select audio channels here. That opens this modified clip window and what we want to do is change the audio source that's going to the track. So if we wanted the louder of the two channels, we click on this box where it says right and select left instead. There. Now we'll get the louder of the two recordings on both the left and right channel in our stereo track. Now when I press OK to confirm the change, watch the waveforms. You'll see them change so that they both look the same. Now play back and watch the audio meters. You'll see that both channels are the same level. Hello, I'm Lizzie. And welcome to this, the third of CADON's series of kit videos. In this video, I'm going to be covering all of the sound equipment that CADON provides its partners. Let's see what happens when we do a similar thing to the clip in the project window. Right click on the clip and select Modify and Audio Channels. There's the same window, but more of the parameters are open for you to change. What I'm going to do is modify this clip so that the two channels go to two separate tracks on my timeline. First, let's change the channel format to mono and then change the number of audio tracks to two. And that's all we need to do. And press OK. And as you can see, this warning window pops up telling you that this change we're making is not going to affect the clip that we've already got in our sequence. So obviously, if you want to do things this way, you need to do it before you start editing. So do we want to continue? Click on yes. Now let's drag the clip to our timeline and you'll see it behaves differently. It's got two tracks of audio, both of which have only one waveform. Now if we only want to use one of these tracks, we can select the clip, right click to unlink and then simply select the track we don't want and press delete on the keyboard. Now let's get back to our edit. It's important for the flow of your audio that nothing starts abruptly, jumps or jars the ear. So what we're going to do now is add some transitions. Let's go back to the effects window and find the audio transitions bin. 
There. Now open up the crossfade bin. Constant power is the standard transition. Let's add it to the beginning of our music so that it fades in. Drag it over and drop it on the beginning of the clip. And there you go, if you play that back, perhaps we should make it a bit longer. There you go, that's good. We also need to add a fade in here where the interview audio comes in. That needs to be a bit shorter because we don't want the fade to affect the voice. We just want the clip to come in unobtrusively. So the cat on low. That sounds okay now. Unlike with cuts on the video side of the timeline, it's often necessary to put transitions between two audio clips so that you can't hear the cut. With audio, you need a smooth, unbroken flow. So let's play back the cut between these two sections of the interview to see if it needs a transition. To hear it clearly, let's turn off the other tracks. If you remember, to do that, you just press these speaker icons here. Now let's have a listen. Kit that they can use. Actually, that sounds natural. I can't really hear the edit point, so there's no need to do anything. But often these edit points can be quite troublesome, especially if you've got a noisy environment or someone who talks quickly. I just want to show you what kind of trouble you might encounter and how to deal with it. So let's zoom in on the cut. Now I'm going to move this cut point with an editing tool we haven't used before to show you what it would sound like if it was in the wrong place. It's called the Rolling Edit Tool, and here it is in the Tools panel. But before we select this tool, let's unlink these two clips so that we can make adjustments to just the audio, rather than both the audio and the video. Click on the first clip and hold down the Shift key and click on the second clip, and now right click and select Unlink. OK, let's select the Rolling Edit Tool now. As you can see, when I hover over my edit point, the cursor turns into these red arrows. What this tool is going to do is adjust the out point of the first clip and the in point of the clip after it without affecting anything else in the sequence. So if we pull this way, the first clip is being made longer and the beginning of the second clip is being eaten into. Rolling Edit is an excellent tool for detailed adjustments like this. I don't want to move this cut much, just a few frames off the original position is enough. And as you can see, as I move it, this little pop-up tells us how many frames I'm moving by. There, now let's play it back. Kit that they can use. And you'll notice that the cut no longer sounds smooth. There's a jump. And if you want to listen to that again. Kit that they can use. That kind of jump is unacceptable and needs to be dealt with. The first thing you should do is see if you can solve the issue by adjusting the cut like we've just done. Most of the time this will work. If it doesn't, what you can do is find the best possible edit point and put a transition over the cut. Although transitions are sometimes problematic too. Let's just add one here so you can see what I mean. Kit to that they can use. Kit to that they can use. As you can hear, that's actually made the cut worse. So let's make the transition shorter. With transitions like this that cover two clips, there are two sides. One is leading out of the first clip and the other is leading into the second. You have to adjust both sides. To do that, I'm going to have to get out of rolling edit and return to the standard selection tool. So we can do that by just pressing the keyboard shortcut V. And now let's shorten the fade so that it only lasts one frame on either side of the cut. And play it back. Kit that they can use. Well, that sounds better, but it still doesn't work. Kit that they can use. It's only going to work if I put the cut back to where it was using the rolling edit tool. So let's select the tool again and adjust the cut and play it back. Kit to that they can use. Kit to that they can use. Kit to that they can use. Kit that they can use. And that's fine now. I don't think the transition makes much difference here, but it isn't doing any harm, so let's just leave it. These are the kind of detailed adjustments you're often going to have to make when polishing your edit. Let's zoom back out again and return to the selection tool. There are still a few more transitions we need to add. We need a short fade out here at the end of the interview, so let's just add that. If I wanted to trim the end off this piece of audio, I could still do that, even with the transition added. As you can see, the transition is unaffected. We also have to deal with the audio from this camera clip and the seaside clip after it. 
To play them back, let's turn the track on again. Types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. Both of these clips provide us with background sound, but are problematic in different ways. The first one is too jarring, and the second one is so quiet you can hardly hear anything. Background audio is an important part of your soundscape. It reinforces what is happening on the visual side and adds atmosphere to the mix. So we want to work on solving the problems these clips present. With the seaside clip, the audio is so quiet it's not going to be of any use to us. So what I'd do is delete the original audio and build up my soundscape with something better, like a recording of waves or seagulls. It's easy enough to do that by finding free-to-use sound effects on the internet, but we don't have time to do that now, so let's leave it as it is. With the camera clip, the audio is very specific to what's happening on the visual side, so I can't replace it. But I do need to make it less jarring. Background audio needs to be subtle. The audience shouldn't really even notice it. The first reason this audio clip jars is because it comes in too abruptly. So let's add a fade in. Types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. That helps at the beginning, but what about here? On the visual side of the timeline, this kind of jump from one clip to the next is normal and accepted, but on the audio side, we want a smooth, continuous flow. So we need to add a transition at the edit point here. As you can see, this is behaving differently than it did before in the interview clips. It's only appearing on one side of the edit point. This happens when one or both of your clips don't have enough media beyond the edit point to accommodate the transition. But don't worry, we still get the merging that we want. Now let's play that back without the interview to hear it more clearly. OK, that's less jarring now. The other thing that makes this audio obtrusive is the fact that it's too loud. It's not very good quality either. And at its current level, the hissing sound is very obvious. So we need to make it quieter. But how quiet should we make it? This is where we need to start working on our volume. Before we do this, let's just tidy up the timeline a bit. We don't need these two clips at the end, so let's just delete them. And let's sort these tracks out so that we can see them all. OK, now when you're working with volume, it's essential to make use of your audio meters. This is your main or master audio meter. It shows the combination of all the audio elements you've brought together on your timeline, the audio that will become your video's soundtrack. 0 dB, or 0 decibels, is the top of the scale and shows the maximum volume level your system can handle. Anything above that is too loud and will clip or distort. Making sure your audio doesn't clip is one of the most basic technical rules you have to follow when dealing with sound. If there are parts of your soundtrack that are too loud, you won't necessarily hear the distortion inside Premiere, although you certainly would once your video is exported. So watching the meter is essential. Luckily, it's pretty easy to see if there's a problem, because these boxes at the top of the meter turn red if any part of your audio goes over 0 dB during playback and they stay red until you stop and restart your playback. Making sure your audio doesn't go over 0 dB is a clear rule, but what volume level should you be aiming for? This isn't such an easy question to answer. If you were preparing something for broadcast on radio or television, you'd need to keep your levels relatively low, often around minus 12 dB. You'd also have to keep within strict limits so that nothing is too loud or too quiet. But these days most video is destined for the web, and on the web, these limits do not apply, instead loudness rules. i found that a lot of media on the internet has audio that's as loud as possible without hitting 0 dB. And that means quiet bits are boosted too, so everything is really loud. I don't think this sounds very good, and it's quite dangerous too. Even if you don't hit the top of the meter, 
if you get too close your audio could still distort when it's played back on poor quality equipment. Also, most video hosting sites like YouTube process the audio you give them, so anything too close to 0 dB could still end up being distorted. So what's the answer? Well, I still want my audio to hold its own on the internet, so it has to be loud, but for safety's sake, I don't want to get too close to 0 dB, so what I aim for is minus 3 dB, or minus 3 decibels. The idea is to have these bars on your audio meter regularly reaching the minus 3 decibels mark, but never going over that. So how are we going to achieve this? Well, to begin with, we need to work on our most important audio element, the voice. So let's turn the interview track on again, and mute the other tracks so that we can play back and get an idea of what we have to do. As it plays, watch the master audio meter. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. So, as you saw at the beginning, the bars were jumping almost to the top of the meter, but they weren't going over 0 dB. At the end, it was reaching peaks between minus 9 and minus 6 dB, so it's clear that this audio is too loud at the beginning and not loud enough at the end. The first thing we need to do is make it more consistent. There are various different ways of achieving this, but perhaps the easiest way is by using keyframes. We talked about keyframes in a previous video when we used them to animate opacity and create a fade out. On the audio side of the timeline, these yellow lines running through each clip default to show volume. If you want to adjust the volume of the clip as a whole, one way of doing this is by grabbing the yellow line, like this, and moving it up and down. As you can see, as I do this, a little pop-up appears to tell me how much I'm adjusting the volume by. Here, 0 dB is not the maximum, it's the original volume level. 0 dB only stands for the maximum when we're dealing with playback. Let's see how this works by making the whole clip quieter. There, let's play that back and watch the meter to see the result. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. So now the loud bits at the beginning are reaching about minus 3 dB instead of getting close to the top of the meter. That's more like what we want, but it's still too quiet at the end. Just so you know, you can also adjust clip volume in the effect controls window. Here's the volume. Let's open it up using this little arrow. And there you can see that the level is around minus 2.6 dB. You may sometimes find it easier to make adjustments here rather than on the timeline because these numbers are easier to control. But let's leave it as it is now and return to the timeline because we want to add keyframes now and that's easier using the yellow volume line. Our aim with the keyframes is to bring the quiet bits up so that the volume evens out overall. Just by looking at the waveform, I'd say we need to make a change around here. So let's position our playhead. and here's the keyframe button. Press it, and a keyframe appears on the volume line. If the keyframe button isn't activated, it's probably because you haven't got your clip selected, so make sure you've clicked on the clip to select it. Now, to make a change, let's add another keyframe a little further on. and now we can drag the second keyframe up. Let's pull it back to around 0 dB. OK, so let's listen to that and watch what the meter does. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of that's looking a little more consistent now, but let's just make the change in volume a bit more subtle. Let's move the keyframes a bit further apart so that the change is more gradual. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with 
a wide variety of different types of kit. That's better, but it's still a bit too quiet at the end of this first clip, so it might be a good idea to add some more keyframes and boost the volume again. So let's give that a go. And now we need to boost the volume of this second interview clip so that it matches. From the waveforms, it looks pretty consistent. So let's just bring the whole volume line up. About 2.6 dB should do it. Let's take a listen to that and watch the meter. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. OK, so now the whole of our interview is reaching roughly minus 3 dB, or minus 3 decibels, here on the master meter. That's good enough, but we will look at it in more detail later on. Using keyframes is a very simple way of achieving consistency, but as a way of working, it has its limitations. When you boost the volume of quiet bits like we have, you also boost background sounds, so the changes can sometimes be quite noticeable. In addition, it's quite fiddly, and you have to be careful not to miss things like this spike in volume on the second clip. Watch the meter carefully as I play it back. It that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. So that spike is clearly going over our self-imposed limit of minus 3 dB. To deal with this, I'd have to create three keyframes to dip the volume where the spike occurs. But I'm not going to do that now, because as always in Premiere, there's another way of working that will not only deal with spikes like this one, but also give us a better level of consistency. This way of working involves adding an audio effect, which is something I'm going to talk about at the end of this video. OK, so now we've got our voice track roughly where we want it. It's time to start mixing our other audio elements. This is where we need to start considering not only the overall volume, but also the balance between our audio elements. The aim is to be able to clearly hear what needs to be heard with nothing being too quiet or too loud. In this case, when the music and the voice are playing together, we want the voice to be dominant, but we still want to clearly hear the music. Let's unmute the music and play it back to get an idea of what we're working with. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. OK, so the music is definitely too loud when the voice is playing, and I think it would be a good idea to make it louder at the beginning so that it grabs attention. To achieve this, we're going to stick with using keyframes. They need to go just where the voice comes in. So let's click on the music clip to select it and position the playhead. Press the keyframe button, and again a little further on. There. Now let's lower the second keyframe to about minus 6 or minus 7 dB. And let's raise the first one to about 3 dB. Make sure the change in volume isn't too abrupt and happens just as the voice comes in so that it isn't too obvious. And let's see if that works. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of OK, now the music is playing around the minus 12 to minus 9 mark here at the beginning. That feels about right. Any louder and it would be overwhelming and out of balance with the rest of the edit. As it is, the reduction in volume when the voice comes in seems natural. And during the interview, I can still hear the music clearly, but it's in the background, allowing the voice to dominate. 
There's a rule that your music should be about 20 decibels lower than any spoken words. But in general, when I'm mixing like this, I prefer to just trust my ears. The same cannot be said about overall volume. For that, your ears are not a good judge. You need to keep an eye on your audio meter, as we've been doing. With the music added in, our volume is now going over minus 3 dB. We're going to have to deal with that, but first, let's have a think about what's going to happen at the end of our edit. What we've done so far is just a short edit. If this were a longer video, there'd probably be sections after this without talking. If the sections were long enough, you could add more keyframes and bring the volume of the music up again, until the next bit of talking came in. This works especially well if it's in time with the music. To show you what I mean, let's try it out. First, let's lengthen the music so that it continues to play after the visuals have faded away. And let's add a keyframe just after the end of the interview. Now if we play back, you'll see how effective the raise in volume is. It happens in time with the music, so it feels like the music is driving things forward. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. Okay. So now we've mixed the music in, we've still got one more audio element to deal with, the sound from the camera clip. If you remember, it was too loud. Let's have another listen. Types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. To make this more in balance with other audio elements, I could just pull the clip's volume line down. But what if there were lots of clips with background sound to deal with? Instead of making adjustments to each clip, a more efficient way of working is to use the track volume. This is one of the reasons it's important to keep different audio elements on separate tracks. To show track volume, rather than clip volume here on the timeline, you need to press on this little button here on the side. As you can see, when I hover over it, it says show keyframes. Press it and select track keyframes. Now you can see that the yellow line runs the whole way along the track rather than through each individual clip. It's worth noting that you can't make any changes to your audio clips when you're showing track volume. Now I could drag this yellow line up or down to make the adjustments I wanted and it would affect the whole track but instead of using the line I find it easier to use the audio mixer which is up here behind the effect controls window. So as you can see the audio mixer has a selection of meters. Each of these corresponds to a track on your timeline. This one on the far right is the master. It's the same as the audio meter on the other side of the timeline and shows the combination of all your audio elements. You may have noticed that the timeline also has a master track right at the bottom. Track volume is adjusted using these faders next to each meter. But before we make any changes, let's do some housekeeping. I find it easier to follow what's going on if the tracks are named according to the audio they hold. You do that by clicking inside this box at the bottom of each audio meter and deleting the name that's already there. Audio 1 holds what's usually called natural sound, so let's write nat sound for short. Audio 2 is the interview, so let's call it interview. And audio 3 is music. Changing the names here also changes them on the timeline. Now let's pull the NAT sound fader down a bit. As we do that, the number at the bottom of the meter changes also. You can make adjustments using the number if you want, but it's easier with the fader. I think minus seven may well be enough. You'll notice that any change I make here is mirrored by the track volume line on the timeline. Now let's play that section back to see if the mix sounds okay. Types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. Yes, that sounds okay now. It doesn't stand out anymore, but I can still hear it enough for it to add atmosphere to the mix. 
If we'd added better audio to the second Seaside clip, it would be the same for that. Now I want to use the mixer to fine tune the balance between my audio elements and make sure the overall volume isn't going over our minus three decibels limit. To do that, let's play the whole thing back and watch the audio meters to get an idea of what's needed. You'll notice as we play back that more numbers appear here at the bottom of the meters. These numbers mirror the readings from the meter and although they don't always keep up and won't show all your peaks, they're helpful when you want to get a more accurate understanding of your volume levels. Let's concentrate first on the master meter. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. So most of that looks okay to me, but you'll have noticed that there were a few points when the volume level went over minus 3 dB. To deal with this, we could just pull the master meters fader down a bit. But you want to be careful about doing this. Lowering your master volume can sometimes hide issues with these other audio tracks, which as I've said, are what come together to make the master. So you need to keep an eye on these meters too. This is especially because if any of them were to clip, you'd get distortion, even if your master volume is turned down. So the golden rule is to make sure nothing ever hits the red here in the audio mixer. Let's play it back again, and this time watch these three meters. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. Okay, so the interview track is going quite high, but nothing is clipping, so it's safe. Now I've checked, if I wanted I could just turn the master volume down. The other way of doing it would be to do a bit more work on my mix and fiddle with all of these tracks to lower the overall volume. If I wanted, I could do this in real time during playback, but I'd have to make sure that automation mode here is set to read or off. Read is the default. These other modes are for adding keyframes to your audio during playback. In other words, you can use the faders to make changes over time, usually to volume levels. This is a quick way of mixing, but I find it quite messy and I prefer to keep things simple by animating manually. Let's continue to keep things simple. I'm pretty happy with the balance of my audio elements, so instead of fiddling around with all of these tracks, let's just turn the master volume down. About minus one should do it. Let's see. Watch the numbers on the master audio meter. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. That looks about right now. There may still be some parts that peak above minus 3 dB, but that doesn't matter too much, because with our self-imposed limit, we're well away from the danger zone. If you did want to deal with any stray peaks, there is a way that doesn't involve fiddly keyframes, and that's by adding an audio effect called dynamics. But before we go on to talk about audio effects, there are a few more things that I want to say about this mixer. These buttons here are quite useful. The M is for muting the track. The S is for solo, which mutes all the other tracks so that only this one plays. The R is for record, and allows you to record straight onto a track, which is useful for voiceovers. To use this function, you need to connect a microphone to your computer and select it in Premiere's Preferences menu under Audio Hardware. Then you've got these dials up here. These show Pan, which is the direction your audio comes from, or the left-right balance of the sound. Pan can also be shown by the yellow line on the timeline. Let's take a look at it here on the track holding our natural sound. This box tells us that the line is currently showing volume, so if you click on the box and we've got the option to change it to Balance. Now we could use the yellow line, or the dials on the mixer, to pan the audio to the left or to the right. You'd need to use pan if you were doing spatial work on your audio, for instance if you wanted the sound of a passing car to move from left to right, 
but in general you want to ignore this function because you want all of your audio to be heard in both ears so it needs to stay centrally balanced which is the default. Ok, so now we've got a mix that works. I want to introduce you to audio effects. Audio effects can be added to individual clips just like on the video side of your timeline but they can also be added to tracks using the audio mixer which is often more efficient. So what we're going to do is add the audio effect I mentioned earlier, dynamics, to the interview track. The reason I want to add it to the interview is because that's our most important audio element and it needs the most work. What we need to do is press this little arrow at the top of the audio mixer here where it says show, hide, effects and sends. That opens up a stack where we can add effects here. The section below is for sends which is for bringing tracks together but we're not going to look at this function in this video. To add effects click on the little arrows here. As you can see a list of audio effects appears and there's the effect we want, dynamics. So if you click on it and there it is in our stack which means it's applied to the track. To make adjustments to the effects values double click on the name here and that brings up the control window. Dynamics has a number of functions but it's mainly used for compression. Compression reduces the dynamic range of your audio by making the quiet bits louder and the loud bits quieter so that it's more consistent. It's often applied together with a limiter which is this function here. This puts a lid on your sound preventing it from going over a set limit. We could have used dynamics instead of keyframes to deal with the inconsistencies of our interview clip. Applying it now isn't that necessary but it will help make the voice sound less rangy and give it more punch. You'll notice that the compressor is already turned on. In general these default settings are quite good and add the right amount of compression but in this case I don't think we need so much makeup. Makeup boosts the volume of the sound to compensate for the compression. Our sound is already quite loud so 2.5 dB should be enough. Now let's turn the limiter on as well because it's going to help control any spikes like the one we were aware of on our second interview clip. This default setting of minus 20 dB or minus 20 decibels means anything that goes over minus 20 will be affected. For us that's pretty much everything. So we need to change this to around minus 2 dB. That's going to make sure everything stays below our target of minus 3 dB. The reason I haven't entered minus 3 decibels here is because we've already got our master volume turned down by minus 1 decibels. So let's play back the interview now and see how that sounds. While we play back, watch this window. You'll notice a bar here jumping up and down when compression is being added and this box will light up red when the limiter is applied. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. So a gentle amount of compression was added pretty much the whole way through. Let's have another listen. So the CADARN Learning Portal has provided its partners with a wide variety of different types of kit that they can use to produce all sorts of different types of content. But the limiter was only applied maybe once or twice. Once at the end here where the spike was. Now you may prefer this punchier sound but I think the compressor has boosted the interview audio too much which has made the recording's background hiss too obvious. So I might decide to turn it off by deselecting this box here. I would keep the limiter on though. With effects added to tracks in the audio mixer you can turn them off by clicking on this little F button here. Or you could just delete them by clicking on the little arrow again and selecting none instead of the effect. To add another effect, just click on the next little arrow in the stack. Dynamics is an effect you'll find yourself using over and over again. Another useful effect is this one here, EQ or equalization. EQ is used to adjust the frequencies of your audio signal and is useful if you want to change the tonal quality of your sound or get rid of a hiss or a low hum. It's quite tricky to use though and we don't have time to go into it in this video. All of the effects you can see listed here can also be found in the audio effects bin here in the effects window. To add one of these effects to an individual clip rather than a whole track you do the same thing as you would on the video side of the timeline as I've already mentioned. Just drag the one you want over to the timeline. Let's take EQ and drop it onto the clip. You could also select the clip and drop the effect into the effect controls window. 
Adjustments can then be made here in the Effect Controls window. So now we've fixed and mixed our audio, our edit is pretty much done. If this were a proper edit, what you should do now is watch the whole thing through a few more times and make sure it all flows and there's nothing else you want to tweak. Then, when you're happy, it's time to turn your edit into a video file. This is a process called exporting. And that's what we're going to look at in the fifth and last part of this series of Premiere Pro training videos.